We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land throughout Australia on which we are recording. We pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Hello and welcome to The Doyen Interviews, the podcast that speaks to inspiring women from the art, architecture and design world. I'm Bridget Nathan and I'm glad you've tuned in. Thank you also to Anon for the beautiful introductory music. In this next episode, we'll be chatting to Nguyen Vo, who is a woman working in construction as well as the host of her own podcast, which is called Everyday People. In Everyday People, she chats to people from all walks of life to hear their stories and to share them with her diverse audience. So Nguyen, thanks for joining us today. To begin, it would be great if you could share a bit about your background. Hello, um, a bit about myself. I've been working in the construction industry for four years now and I decided to do a podcast last year because I felt like I needed to do a passion project that is separate from my job and like kind of experiment with my creativity and how I express myself separate from my job. Um, and that's actually really good because when it's separate, I feel like the the energy that I gain from building my passion and growing my passion, that energy gets put back into my job, um, which is great because sometimes when you work so much, that can take away energy from who you are. Yeah, so like I said, I, I wanted to experiment with creating because... I felt like throughout university and throughout work, I was a big observer and I would, I mean, I would observe and I would be very interested in how, like, the, the social aspects of things. Naturally, I'm just drawn to the social issues that I see and I think about it a lot and I thought, um, why not kind of communicate the way I want through through like a podcast um, and bring people together on that journey because like I said I'm very drawn to social issues and social issues obviously involve people. Um, That's one part and yeah the other part is after four years I decided to resign from my job and move overseas to London Um, but as you know the COVID kind of Uh, happened. I mean, 2020 has been a crazy year. Um, And yeah, I'm sure everyone can relate that you you have plans, but it's obviously changed. And what's it like in London at the moment? Um, Are things a little bit different to what you're seeing in Melbourne? Yeah, I mean, it's a high density city compared to Melbourne. And it's, and it's, it's such an international city as well. So there's you know, been a lot of people going in and out of London, obviously, as well. Um, whereas Australia, we're so far away from everyone. So I think the risk is lower and we're also spaced out more. Um, yeah, there's like a huge fear here and lockdown was taken very, very seriously here, I think, compared to Melbourne, maybe. And, you know, we're still experiencing it now. Um, shops don't open until the 15th of June and it's the 6th of June today um yeah um it would be great if you could talk a bit about the everyday people podcast and where it all um came from that was I mean that everyday people side of it and sharing stories and making it relatable was really inspired by a um leadership camp that I did about four or five years ago, and I mentioned this camp so many times because it was such a big impact on me, unlike me doing creative projects and, and things. But it's called Ryla, where I think it was 60 people from all around Victoria um, was given a sponsorship to go on this um, one-week-long camping leadership um trip to Mount Evelyn and it was very interesting that you had to in the application you have to say what you were passionate about what community projects you have done so that's what they assessed you on but they also 
uh, made sure that they picked two people from each suburb kind of thing, like from like each area. So you end up meeting people that you would never, ever meet. Like you'd meet people from Ballarat, from Bendigo, um, yeah, everywhere. So like the west side, the east side, the south side. And the, the whole trip was about how we're all very diverse and all our voices matter. And there was this particular this particular um, task that we had to do where we were all in a room and we had to write down our insecurities on a piece of paper and then we had to throw it and you'd pick up someone's um, insecurity and you read it. And what you learn is that even though we all look so different, this person shows so much confidence, that person, you know, is not as confident or someone's really loud we all have insecurities. We all experience life together and we have the full experience, the good and the bad. Yeah, that's so interesting to hear. Um, I really enjoy listening to your podcast. When you started it, did you have a clear idea about where you were going? Definitely when I first started my podcast, I had a very strong vision and I feel you can't pursue any project without a strong vision because it's just, I don't know, it's difficult. (laughs) Um, But, but yeah, I reflected back and was thinking, you know, what, you know, what was my vision? Have I forgot it? (laughs) Um, But the thing that I realised that I tend to um, try and communicate a lot but still trying to figure out how to communicate is... um, like the theme in my a big theme in my life is being a bridge. I feel, you know, being being a Vietnamese Australian, being born into a family where I speak Vietnamese, grew up in Vietnamese culture, and then living in the Western culture, I feel like I'm the bridge between Western and Eastern. Yeah, because I'm like the middle person. You know, I can understand, I can understand my Vietnamese culture, but then I also understand Australian culture. So. Uh, like I'm the bridge and then for example even with the podcast like the bridge is bringing you someone that you don't usually meet to your world you know for example if you're someone from construction listening in to my friend who's a hairdresser like I'm the bridge of sharing um the two different worlds and that's in my opinion that's how community is created or that's how integration works Integration doesn't work if you're not exposing yourself to people who are different to you and if you're in the same circle all the time. And that has always been so important to me because I always felt like I'm in the middle or like I don't really belong anywhere. So the bridging is so important to me. You know, if someone meets me, a Vietnamese, Australian woman, young woman in construction, and then they meet someone similar to me later on, they know how to interact with the next person better. Because you're... Yeah, understand another person better once you're exposed to them. I mean, it's even for me, if I was to meet someone who does a, a hobby that I have no idea about, but then I learn from them, and then the next person I meet that has a similar hobby, like, I'm able to chat to them better. Like, it, 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 it applies to every scenario. But even, but even like, when I use the word, you know, the, being a bridge, it's just something that, I've been able to articulate recently. I think I've always been like that and kind of seen the world in that way. Um, but like slowly as I get older, like words pop up that I'm like, yeah, like that's a good word to explain it. And then what's really, really crazy though, um, which kind of can help me to articulate how I see the world even more, is that um, I went on a WA trip with my friend in February this year, early this year, and not long ago, and we stayed at an Airbnb um, with Airbnb hosts who are in the kind of healing world, and the guy was um, a specialist in Ayurveda, I never say that word right, but we had a chat, and I told him about my podcast and about the construction world, and out of nowhere he said, Oh, wait, actually, I also told him about, like, my Vietnamese side and Western side, blah, blah. 
and, I, and out of nowhere he said to me, you speak in um, non-duality. And, and I was like, what, the, what is that? Like, what, what's non-duality? And, he's, and he was like looking at me in like, with so, like, so much intrigue. And even in, when I'm not talking about the podcast or the structure, I'm just talking just normal, generally. He's like, there you go again. You're talking in non-duality. Um, and so I looked it up and we kind of talked about what non-duality is. But it's, it's again, it's a, about a bridge. Like, it's about not, it's about seeing the world as like a whole, as like a whole and not separate. He said people his age, I'm not sure how old he is, but he said people his age from his generation see things very like duality, like that is separate to that. You, you experience it in everyday life as well, like, um, for example, people in construction is separate to architects. <laughs> you know, there's like no bridge. It's like people, be- people belong there. Um, or whereas I'm always merging. Like my mind's always see things as merging. I don't know. I don't know. But it's just really, it's really funny that he just while I'm just talking normally, he's just like, "There you go again." Like it's <laughs> non-duality. <laughs> I pr- like I protect it as well in that I always give it like my time and give it a voice when I talk to people about it and like and also I don't want to forget it I don't want to forget what I experienced or um yeah how like what what my culture is like um I think about it all the time and I've always thought about it but a lot of people don't think about it because it doesn't affect them as much or something but you know I'm sure the diversity thing affects other people more than me as well um but it's definitely been a big theme in my life and it it shows up in everything that I do like I can't run away from it (laughs) so I guess when I create it's something I think about all the time and how you know how do I weave that in um because that's like I don't know it's my story um you know for someone who doesn't think about it a lot um they could have something else that they think about a lot that they can integrate into their creative project. You know, we're all unique in, in that sense. And and again, when I when when I said it's a big part of my life, like it's it's also unique because of like I said, me growing up Vietnamese. So that comes from that. And I'm sure everyone has um, something they care about that comes from something as well. And that's fine. So. Um when you think about your podcast, what did you learn from it? If we talk broadly and generally, what did I learn from doing this podcast? I would say like a really big thing that I want to share is that your perspective that you have right now will not come again. So me as a 28 year old working construction, um, Navigating life, navigating the construction world. Me in 10 years, I'm not going to be that same person with the same themes in my life. I'll be a different person. What I create then will be different. And, you know, I had three episodes that I recorded end of last year that I was supposed to release. But it took me four months. It's taken me a while because I just moved overseas. I was prioritizing other things. And then when I listen back to my podcast, I'm like, I'm a different person now. (laughs) I have different views now. Um, Even the start of my podcast, what I say, um, I believe that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're famous or blah, blah, blah. I don't know. Listen listen to it because I don't remember it. But what I said then at the intro, like if I was to do an intro of my podcast now, it'll be different. So I think, yeah, people might say, you're not that experienced or you're too young or um, give you reasons for why your perspective doesn't matter. Like, I disagree. I think you should value your perspective, like, now because you're speaking for yourself now and you're speaking for the people who are experiencing um, being young or who are experiencing struggles that you're experiencing and that's a unique perspective 
that should be heard. Um, so don't wait for when you feel like you've got 10 years of experience or when you've got, I don't know, whatever reason you think will make your voice more valuable. Because uh, having diverse voices and having diverse um, stories out there help people on that journey because not 100% of the world is 10 years experienced, you know. There's a lot of people who are going through what you're going through right now. And, so, and sometimes they're speaking for the younger people as well. For example, like I say, in 10 years' time, um, I don't know, I'm on a board for something and I want to help the younger people. I can't, I can't speak for them. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I remember that, what I was like. I can't remember what I was like when I was in my 20s. I've changed. So I can't speak for them. They need to speak for themselves or they need to give their input. Um, so that's what I mean by like, I'm going to, my perspective is going to change. I'm not going to remember. I can't. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be speaking from where I am at that point. So I think that's another part of diversity. It's your age or your, the things you are going through that shapes what you think now. And when you speak up, you're speaking up for that di diversity. <laughs> and I think it was also this thought that came about was also to comfort me that it's okay to share what you think, Nyung, because... That's it, you know. Value what we have to think now because we know it's going to disappear. So then, you know, you know. yeah. And and I think another thing that really made me realise that was the article I was writing. As you know, I was writing an article that I was that was uh, that I was going to post on LinkedIn, and it was going to be called "Good Manager, Bad Manager," and it's going to be about my experiences as a young person with all the different managers that I've had on the different projects, but. I was writing it at a time where I was really busy and I was getting ready to move to the UK. And then once I did get to the UK, I'm like, okay, let's finish this article. And I was reading it and I'm like, I can't even tap into that person that was writing this anymore. I've changed the last few months. And where I was then is different to now. So again, I was like, God oh, damn it, you know, whatever you're doing, finish it because you're going to change again and your mind's like, and what I, when I read back, I was like, this is great, but I couldn't tap into it. It was great. Like time passed and you're just like, damn it, <laughs> you know, value this moment now and finish creating now. Um, you know, like when, you know how when food goes off and food, like there's a due date on it, that's life as well. Wow, there's um, so much in what you've just said. Um, I find that so, so interesting. Um what has it been like hearing other people's responses to your podcast? Has it caused uh, new conversations to happen with your friends or your family? It's more people from work. Like when I was working on a construction project and a subcontractor that I didn't get along with <laughs> because because sometimes that happens because, you know, you work for the builder and – you know, they're the contractor and you have disagreements. But then one day on the phone, he's like, oh, by the way, I listen to your podcast and I love it. And, I was, and like, that was like how we connected. <laughs> that's really nice. And he's like, yeah. And he was even like, oh, I played it like in the, in the taxi on my way to I don't know, the office or something. And he played it out loud for his colleagues to hear as well. And he's like, and he's like, that's Nyung. That's the girl that works in that project. And, yeah, he was listening to my friend who was a hairdresser, you know, like, again, I'm the bridge. <laughs> I'm bridge between the subcontractor and these people from different worlds. And do you think that it's enabled people to see a different side of you? It's like, like they get to see the human side of me um, and not just my job. And I think, yeah, that's definitely a way everyone would connect better if they get to see the human side of you. And so that, you know, my podcast is a platform for that as well. The professionals that are on there, your colleagues get to see the human side of you. And and I think that's sometimes inspiring because we forget to bring ourselves to work sometimes. Um, or we forget to um, kind of, we forget to, like, 
continue to be ourselves because we can lose I feel like we can lose our soul and we can lose our stuff as well if we're too much in the external world and like doing what everyone else wants us to do and doing what needs to get the job done that you forget to feed your soul and you know I, I really really believe that everyone um, wants or needs to have their soul like to be heard or to be given time in order to feel like at their best um because we're human like i always like it always relates back to that we are human we're not machines not computers um we thrive most when we tap into our human side yeah yeah i totally um agree with that i've definitely experienced that as well with my podcast um what about your um your career your everyday career um I feel like I know a bit about your podcasting journey but not so much about what you do for a job um what did you study at university and how has that um yeah led into a career in the construction industry I think you mentioned you studied engineering um but I believe you now work in more of a project management type role? Yeah, so I did study engineering. Um, I've always had a curious mind and I've always wondered how things work and stuff. So that really kind of guided me into, you know, physics and maths and then onto engineering. And then after engineering, I decided to go into the construction world because I have like, a strong um, passion for people and I knew that engineering was like very technical and like I reckon if I did it I would have enjoyed it because whatever you choose to do you become good at it and you enjoy it but I knew that a big part of my life will have to be like interacting with people and working with people um, so yeah construction and it's more construction management my last title was project coordinator, but I would say um, it'd be like an assistant project manager where you get a project from the client and you work with your team to, so it's got to do with, like project manager is always got to do with money, quality, so money costs, quality, and, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in the industry for <laughs> the while time quality and, yeah and timeline like so time quality and time so those are the three things that like matter the most in construction management so so yeah so you deal with all three of them and you always have to think of all three of them but you know you should also think about sustainability <laughs> yeah so I get thrown on a project like that's the exciting thing about working in construction that you get thrown on projects you finish it and then you get thrown on another project and different people that you work with, different clients. Like it's, it's, it's very exciting. And it, like when I was um, yeah, thinking about what to study and that, like I knew, I knew that, that would, like working on different projects is definitely going to be my thing because like, it, like I love learning and I love growing and I love being exposed to different things. It's always been a big theme in my life as well. So, yeah, that's the exciting thing about being in construction. And, you know, the other thing is that even for your manager, even for your site manager, it's a new project for them as well. So it's like, yeah, you have experience, but that problem that, can, that arise, some of the problems is a problem for all of us that we've never seen before. So you get the, you hop in a project and you, you start off with the money, like this is how much money you got from the client, and now I need to kind of employ my contractors who would do the bill for me. But then I need to make sure I make money, like based on what the client's given me. You have to write up scopes of works and you make sure you don't miss out scope because the contractor will come back and say, you didn't include this, so this is going to cost this X amount of money. So then you make a loss, you know, there's, and there's negotiating, which I think is a people skills you have to pick up. Um, there's just so much to it, to construction, project management. So that's the first part where you, where you make the money, but then you also have to make sure that they can do it in time and that, um, the quality is great. Um, and then the next part is delivering the project. So you have to make sure that the contractors come onto site and like 
all the safety stuff is done um, and the site manager would coordinate between the different contractors like this you know, contractor can come in at this time and then the next one comes in. Um, there's things like looking at shop drawings, reviewing that with the engineers and the architects and then like the production of materials whether you put steel or whether you pour in concrete. So there's lots of like stop points that you need to put into your program, if, like where you need to assess um, before something can be done. And there's like compliance that needs to be ticked off. Um, and like, so once you've done all the steel and the concrete, there's also stuff like ordering all your loose bits and pieces, like toilet roll holders and um, like sinks and so there's that stuff as well where you need to, um, again, negotiate with the supplier. So there's like suppliers and there's contractors. But when it comes to a new build project, it's also issues like buildability, like what was shown on the drawing doesn't work on site. So we need to do a meeting with everyone and come up with an agreement and that's going to maybe cost a little extra. And, you know, there's how are we going to make money off that and how do we keep our client happy? Um, yeah, towards the end, it's it's um, making sure the building survey is happy so then we can get it ticked off so that we can then occupy the building. There's a lot of compliance stuff that we need, need to go through, um, which has got to do with quality. Um, wow, cool. It sounds um, pretty similar to the role of architect. Um, to finish up, it would be cool to hear about what type of projects do you like working on most? My favourite project has always been the government projects. I like working with them as a client. Um, like for me, the underlying thing that, you know, it's, it's working for the government, so it's working for the people. Like that really always motivates me compared to if it's an apartment building with, like, really – rich investors as clients naturally I don't care as much um, so these hospital projects are complex and there's lots of people involved and you know there's if you're working next to an existing hospital there's there's lots of communication that's needed like I like the communication part of things and like you know how to um, make sure that the, the existing hospital isn't impacted by our build um, so it's always like, so those are like the soft skills where you have to keep the client happy, make, keep everyone informed, know who to communicate to and what to communicate, what to not communicate. There's all this like politics and things and I like all of that. Um, like kind of like the pro the project has like a life, like of its own, I don't know. <laughs> um, and it's, it's different compared to like a small, like office fit out where there isn't that much politics and you just do the job and you're done. Um, whereas these big projects, it's like, I don't know. It's like, a, I don't know. I, I just enjoy the big ones where it's more complex and kind of everyone's, everyone's taken on the ride because it's complex for everyone. <laughs> yes, I definitely know um, the feeling of that. Did you have... Um, any final thoughts that you could share about the Everyday People podcast and the name Everyday People? Um, it would be great to, yeah, to finish up on that. You've shared so many amazing things. So um, thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely every woman has a name in their own way. I am able to see the amazing sides of everyone I think we, we all have bad sides but we also have to remember we also have amazing sides to us and unique traits about us um, and everyday people is especially powerful because we are so relatable um, and I think you know you can hear stories from celebrities and people that are so like out of reach for you but when you hear stories from the everyday people you realize that you're not alone 
and I feel like when you feel like you're not alone, it just comforts you. Um, and you just feel more integrated into society. Thanks, Jung, for your time today. It's been amazing to hear about your project. Um, I can't wait to see what happens with it. Next up, we'll be chatting to Tanya Davich. Um, we'll be hearing about a few things that she's been working on. So I hope you can join us then. Okay, thanks. I think it's really interesting because I suppose at a more academic level, public spaces like that, so like libraries and, you know, the National Gallery, for example, and 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 those kind of institutions, you know, public space should be seen as part of that network, definitely. And I think they're, they're really important democratically because they're spaces that we can all access without necessarily paying for them. It doesn't matter what your, you know, what the colour of your skin is. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. Um, you know, these spaces anybody can access or should be able to access. So. I think a big part of, of what makes a public space is, you know, access to it and equality. Um, and, you know, the question is, is then if you put a commercial entity on the edge of that, a big commercial en entity on the edge of that public space, who does that include? Who does that exclude?